the war that saved my life, chapter five. The day got worse, it was bound to. The train stopped and started and stopped again. Hot sun poured through the windows until the air seemed to curdle. Small children cried, bigger ones fought. Finally, we stopped at a quay, but a bossy woman standing there wouldn't let us out. She argued with the head teacher and then with all the other teachers, and then even with the man running the train. The teacher said we had to be let out for the love of mercy, but the woman who had a face like iron and a uniform like a soldier's, only with a skirt, thumped her clipboard and refused. I'm to expect 70 mothers with infant children, she said, not 200 school children. It says so here. I don't care in the least what's written on your paper, the head teacher spat back. The teacher supervising our car shook her head and opened the door. Out, all of you, she said to us. Loo's are in the station. Remember, a loo is a bathroom. We'll find you something to drink and eat. Out you go. Out we went in a thundering herd. The other teachers followed, opening the doors to their cars. The iron-faced woman scowled and barked orders everyone ignored. It was more noise and rush than I'd ever seen. It was better than fireworks. Jamie helped me off the train. I felt stiff all over and I had to go something desperate. Show me how to use the loo, I told him. Sounds funny, but it was my first real loo. At home, our flat shared the one down the hall, but I just used a bucket and Mam or Jamie emptied it. I think I gotta use the boys one, Jamie said. What do you mean the boys one? See, he pointed to two doors. Sure enough, all the boys were going through one door, the girls through another. Only now, lines snaked out the doors. Tell me what to do then. You pee in it, and then you flush, he said. What's flush? How do I flush? There's a handle, like, and you push it down. I waited my turn, and then I went in and figured it out, even the flushing. There were sinks and I splashed water onto my hot face. A girl right in front of me, the shabbiest, nasty, look, nastiest looking girl I'd ever seen, was using a sink in front of my sink, which seemed odd. I frowned at her and she frowned back. All of a sudden I realized I was looking in a mirror. Ma'am had a mirror. It hung high on the wall and I never bothered with it. I stared into this one appalled. I'd assumed I looked like all the other girls but my hair was clumpy, not smooth. My skin was paler than theirs, milky white, except it also looked rather gray, especially around my neck. The dirty calluses on my knees stood out beneath my faded skirt, which suddenly seemed grubby and too small. What could I do? I took a deep breath and staggered out. Jamie was waiting. I looked him over with new critical eyes. He was dirtier than the other boys too. His shirt was faded into an inter in indeterminate color. Indeterminate means you can't tell what it is. And his fingernails were rimmed in black. We should have baths, I said. Jamie shrugged, doesn't matter, but it did. At home, when I looked out my window onto the lane across the street, three buildings to the left on the co corner, I could see a fishmonger shop. They got fish delivered every morning and laid it out for sale on a thick, cold piece of stone. In the summer heat, fish could go off fast, so women knew to pick through the selections carefully and choose only the freshest and the best. That's what we children were, fish on a slab. The teachers herded us down the street into a big building and lined us against one wall. Men and women from the village filed past, looking to see if we were sweet and pretty and wholesome enough to take home. That they didn't think many of us were good value was clear from the expressions on their faces and the things they said. Good Lord, one woman said, reeling away from sniffing a little girl's hair. They're filthy. They'll wash, the iron-faced woman said. She directed operations from the corner of the room, clipboard still in hand. We need to be generous. We didn't expect so many. We've got to do our bit. My bit don't extend to a pack of dirty street rats, an old man retorted. This lot looks like they'll murder us in our beds. They're children, the iron-faced woman replied. It's not their fault what they look like. I looked around. The village girls, 
handing round cups of tea were sort of shiny bright. With ribbons in their hair, they looked like they would smell nice. Maybe not, another woman said, but they're not much like our children, are they? The iron face woman opened her mouth to argue, then shut it without saying a word. Whatever we were, we weren't like their children. That much was clear. Ada, Jamie whispered, nobody wants you and me. It was true. The crowd was thinning out. Fewer and fewer children remained. The teachers pushed us together and said nice things about us. The iron-faced woman cajoled the remaining villagers. A blue-haired old woman put her hand on Jamie's arm. I won't take the girl, she said, but I suppose I could manage the little boy. You don't want him, I said. He steals and bites, and without me to manage him, he might go back to having fits. That's pretty smart of Ada, huh? The woman's mouth dropped into a soundless O. She scuttled away and went off with somebody else's brother. And then the hall was empty, save the teachers, the iron woman, Jamie, and me. Ma'am had been right. No one would have us. We were the only ones not chosen. Don't worry, it gets happier. That was the end of chapter five.